Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sunrise Podcast. Today's episode is very special as for the first time ever, we are doing an interview and our guest is a member of a world famous rock band Survivor known for their smash hit Eye of the Tiger. He has also written music for TV shows and films and you can hear him on a variety of TV networks such as TLC and HBO. And also, he had a minor role in a famous film, Karate Kid, back when he was a teenager. And more importantly, our guest has had a world of experience in the music industry and a lot of great stories to tell, as you will hear if you stay tuned with the show. So, Jeffrey Bryan, the member of Survivor. Enjoy the interview. Hello, Jeffrey. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to this. Uh, hello, Alex. Uh, how are you doing? Hello, guys. Hello, Jeff. Uh, thanks for Hi. coming on the show. Hello, Vlada. Uh, yes, I'm fine. Trying to cope with the hot weather here in Belgrade, Serbia. Um, it wow. is like over 30 degrees of Celsius, so... Summer is officially here. I'm not a big fan of it, but um, I'm trying to cope with it, drinking a lot of water <laughs> and uh, keeping keeping myself, you know, um, out of the out of the the hot weather. Yes, lots of fluids. Stay hydrated. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So Jeff, uh, first of all, uh, like I said, thank you for coming on the show. Um, we would like we would like to ask you first to do a little introduction of yourself and also as most of us know uh, you are the member of the band Survivor so can you also tell us a little bit about how you ended up playing in this band? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, I'm uh, as as Alex mentioned or no Vlada. Uh, you know, I'm it's from Alex, Los Angeles. It's Alex. <laughs> Alex. Okay. Well, I I had a fifty fifty shot there. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. I'm from I'm from Los Angeles originally, born and raised. Uh, grew up in the '80s. Uh, been a musician my whole my whole life. Uh, started out as a singer and formed my own bands, and basically was trying to be a singer songwriter. Piano didn't come into uh, into the mix until a little bit later. I I, I played guitar and piano, but uh, I found the piano to be my instrument. And as the years went on. Uh, I started to uh, kind of market myself as a keyboard player. And to be honest, I have a lot of really cool stories about the 80s and some other things that I've done. But when it comes to Survivor, I don't have a great story. I, I literally got an email one day uh, that said, hey, do you want to play for the band Survivor? <laughs> and, oh, wow. Uh, it, yeah, it was one of those oh, wow emails I'm, I'm, you, you don't expect to actually really receive. And... One day I just opened my email and there it was and I uh I didn't know what whether it was real cuz it was such a strange kind of one line do you want to play for survivor period that was it so I thought is it a joke what is this so well, that's I, quite I, simple. I, I yeah so I eventually I you know I answered it obviously and um you know obviously it was them and they uh they and now how they found me I can't say for sure. Uh, you know, I've I've been playing in L.A. for many, many years. Uh, in fact, the keyboard player that was currently in the band at the time, I actually knew who he was. He's friends with a lot of friends I know in L.A. We're not friends directly, but he he knows a lot of people I know. It, you know, it, so it's it's not surprising that somehow my name got got to theirs somehow through my L.A. connections. But um, it was it was very uh, exciting. And certainly not expected. It was just one of those crazy, you know, uh, serendipitous kind of things. It just happened. So I'm very proud of it. I'm very happy it did. And, you know, uh, yeah, that the rest sounds, is history, as they say. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. You know, uh, being able to play in a band with so much history, with a certain fan base, so what I wanted to ask you about your experience playing with Survivor, playing concerts, are there any particular tracks of theirs that you really get a kick out of playing live? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, yeah, for a rock band, uh, especially an 80s rock band, that it, during the time, during the mid-80s, there were a lot of what we call in the States hair bands, you know, uh, bands like Cinderella and, and uh, Motley Crue. Well, I would, yeah, I guess Motley Crue back then was kind of a hair band. But the point is, is that keyboards was very, very important to um, Survivor. And they were more in the kind of foreigner journey camp. And so there's a lot of very important keyboard uh, iconic parts that are really fun to play. High on you. It's a simple part, but it's it just every time you start playing that lick, you know, it's just immediate and people love it. And that's always exciting. But for me, I really enjoy playing uh, The Search is Over. Uh, I, I usually get a piano solo before we go into it. So I get uh, the stage to myself, and I usually play about 10 or 15 minutes of piano, and then we go into the Search is Over, which is, you know, that beautiful ballad that was, uh, I don't know how big of a hit it was in your part of the world, but in the United States, it was a monster hit. Um, I, I, to be fair, I'm not quite certain myself how big that song was. Uh, in former Yugoslavia, in the, because I'm, I was born in the 80s, so I can't recall... But, yeah. you know, everybody knows Survivor uh, by Eye of the Tiger, of course. But yeah. there were some other major hit songs. And uh, we were going through the catalog prior to doing this interview. And uh, we noticed that uh, that record, Vital Signs, has a lot of power ballads. So that they're definitely known for that. And that's where, I guess, keyboards play a major role. Yeah. Well, keyboards always played a major role in most of their albums. Uh, but Vital Signs, you know, produced by Ron Nevison, was a uh, unbelievable masterpiece. I mean, what a beautiful record that was. The whole album is it's got you know hits all over it. Yeah, exactly. And I just want to quickly ask you, um, Jeff, when we talk about the piano and the keyboards, um, is there much similarities between the two? You mean with respect to the instruments? Yes, so the sound that, that comes out oh, of no. both of those instruments. Is there oh, any absolutely difference? absolutely not. Oh, yeah. There's, they're, not, they're nothing alike. I mean, a piano is a piano. We all know what a piano is. And uh, the synth parts come from, for them, back in the 80s, they, their, their synth of choice was mostly a Jupiter 8. A lot of, uh, a Roland Jupiter 8, which is... Um, a very, very famous and popular, was popular in the 80s. And um, if you, if, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with their songs, but if you listen to songs like High on You, uh, Can't Hold Back, I'm, I'm thinking of the hits right now. Uh, you know, a lot of those songs are yeah, yeah. have some thick, you know, synth pads and synth stabs. And, um, you know, they're very, they're very iconic sounding. They're, they're definitely not piano. And that's what, when, when I think Vlad asked me about um, what song I like to play a lot, I, I always lean toward piano because it's so much fun. I, I, piano is just a great instrument, very expressive, and The Search is Over is a primarily is primarily a piano ballad. So it's pretty much the only keyboards I'm playing on that song is, is mostly piano and some string pads, but piano is, the, is really uh, distinctive in that song. Yes, yes, cool, Jeff. I want to ask you also, so before you got this special, unbelievable email, uh, were <laughs> you a fan of this band? Oh, who wasn't? <laughs> uh, you know, there were so many bands that I had been uh, following through the years. I mean, you know, everything from Journey, Bad Company, Foreigner, uh, you know, those were those were great bands, and 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 the Survivor fit right in there. Um, but I will say this: for me, being in the you know being trying to be in the music business in the '80s, I was influenced by so many different things. Everything from you know stuff that was coming in from from the UK, uh, from Brian Ferry, Roxy Music, and all that stuff. And you know, I was a song guy. I was really interested in great songs. So any anything that had a great song, I suddenly was interested in. So I, I wasn't really, I didn't follow any particular band, if that answers your question. I, I was always a fan of great songwriting. And Survivor, I think they're almost 
a little bit underrated in the sense that if you go back and listen to some of the songs that are on these uh, on these records, the, especially the ones that weren't hits, um, great songwriting, you know. And just from that basis alone, I'd be a fan. So yeah, the music is just it, it's just so much fun to reproduce. So yeah, you could say I was a fan among among uh, many other bands that I had known. I never knew I would would actually meet them later on in life. So that's just crazy, you know. Yeah, that was a big surprise, I guess. You've just touched on a very interesting part and a very interesting topic to be precise. Can you list uh your let's say favorites or biggest influences, you know, biggest musical inspirations growing up? Well, I would break that down by what they do. Because originally, I, as I mentioned before, I, I started out as a singer. So I was following people that I thought were uh, people that I wanted to emulate. You know, um, Dennis D. Young from Styx comes to mind. Steve Perry, Lou Graham from Foreigner, um, Paul Rogers, Bad Company. These were all my heroes. These were all, you know, Jamie and Jimmy Jameson, of course, from from Survivor. These were just phenomenal singers and people that, you know, I was trying to sort of model myself in terms of singing uh, after. Now, musically, that's a whole different thing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a composer and, um, and a musician, so I had another world of influences, everything from Trevor Horn, anything he produced. Uh, from I, I'm sure you guys know who Trevor Horn is. Yeah, the Art phenomenal and, producer. And, yeah, right. yeah, just crazy, amazing career. Uh, Nile Rodgers is another. I'm a huge fan of Nile Rodgers. Brian Ferry. So I kind of live in more than one world. Uh, you know, I I kind of kind of follow different different things for different reasons, different people and different different bands for different reasons. But um, I mean, Sting. I mean, I, I was, I, I have every one of his records. I, I you know, love Sting. Uh, I was listening to some of the covers you did on your YouTube channel, and I really enjoyed the renditions uh, you did, especially uh, the version of Life on Mars uh, by David oh, Bowie. And, um, thank you. I, I want to ask you about that that song in particular, because... You you played that beautiful piano part, which was originally played by Rick Wakeman, I think, of the Yes right. fame. Uh, it so, was Rick Wakeman. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I want to ask you, which keyboard players had a special influence on your playing? Uh, were there any players that you wanted to emulate, growing and developing as a keyboard player? Oh sure, Leon Russell comes to mind. Um, uh, I, you know, that guy has had so much soul. And, uh, I mean, he was also a guitar player, but his keyboards were just crazy. Um, Elton John, I can't, you know, I, I have, you know, I know a lot of people say that, but there's a reason for it. I mean, the the guy had amazing chops. And, uh, yeah, anything he played was just, you know, really uh, inspiring. Uh, I was probably also inspired by uh, Daryl Dragon from Captain Tennille. Uh, which interesting story. I actually uh, met Daryl back in the eighties when he was, uh, when he owned Rumbo recording studios and I recorded uh, some demos from my original band with his assistance. He allowed me to come in and, and gave me the studio to record. It was also at that time that survivor was recording uh, some of their records. I think it was vital signs and, um, I never met them at the time, but we were in the same studio around the same time. <laughs> and uh, he played, Daryl Dragon played on a lot of uh, Survivor records. I didn't know that then, but it's just, I thought it was an interesting story, especially considering the fact that, you know, he was also a phenomenal keyboard player that, that I respected greatly. Uh, yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, some of these names you mentioned are also among my favorites, so I can totally relate except that I don't know how to play the keyboards. <laughs> uh, I, I also, Not yet. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm... I don't want to forget Howard Jones and Thomas Dolby, too, because those are huge influences on my writing. All right, some, some wonderful names there. Um, but now I want to ask you about something completely different. Um, you were a part of the cast of the original Karate Kid film. 
And I mean, that must have been an awesome thing. So can you tell us something about how you got into acting as a teenager? How was that whole experience being on such a major film? Well, Karate Kid was uh, one of the first, I mean, it was the second movie I was actually in. I starred in another movie prior to that that didn't come out to after that. But the Karate Kid was certainly the most, um, wow. I mean, you know, at the time, it, it was supposed to be a two-week thing. I was supposed to go in there for just, it was a very short job. But it's before I even showed up on set, they renegotiated the contract and had, had me staying on for the entire uh, film, shooting of the film, which was close to six months. And... Um, I didn't have an enormous part, but I guess there were there were other parts in the script that didn't make it at the end. So there's there's a ton of stuff that they ended up editing out and things that they didn't use in the script. But just to be around that that uh, that um, those amazing people and just just to be part of that, you know, I, I can only look at it from a retrospective point of view because at the time I was 18, I wanted to be a musician. The acting thing was a complete accident. I wasn't really trying to be an actor. And I felt, to be honest, I felt a little uncomfortable on the set. You know, I was surrounded by people that had studied acting and cared about acting. You know, I studied music and cared about music. And so I kind of felt a little bit like a fish out of water sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so I have, I have sort of a different, uh, you know, depending on what time period I'm looking at it from. You know, if you asked me when I was 18, I'd be like, ah, I want to get out of here. <laughs> but, you know, in retrospect, wow, what an amazing thing to be a part of, you know. It's still today. It's, it's just people want to talk to me about it all the time. Yes, and something that a lot of actors complain about is that whenever a stranger meets them on the street, they go like, oh, you, you were in that movie or you were in that movie, so... Do people recognize you on the street and, and, you know, approach you and ask you about the Karate Kid, Jeff? No, not anymore. Um, when it came out, uh, I had another movie out called Hot Moves, which I actually starred in. I, I had a, a lead role in that movie. And uh, that one they actually recognized me from. Well, Karate Kid, to be honest, I didn't have a lot of on-screen uh, time. I had a, a, a few lines, and I was able to uh, get a little bit of... of of uh camera time but not enough for people to not enough for people to remember plus you know it wasn't that important to the story as it turned out uh, i wish i had um but that's you know no so the answer to your question is no <laughs> not really plus you know i look a lot different probably than i did then you know i was 18 i had hair and you know i look like a, a teenager <laughs> absolutely absolutely jeff so Let's get back to music, as that's as as we can uh, see uh, your uh, your expertise. So I want to ask you about your uh, music taste in general, especially uh, in your teenage years. So um, my question is: Did your interest in music from a young age help you in networking? You know, getting to know people and, and also getting yourself into the scene. How much? Was that of a factor back then? Well, uh, to answer that question, it's probably easier to, to, to say that, um, you know, my whole world was trying to get into that scene. So it was like every day I was trying to do something that was going to put me in front of somebody or some people or do something. So I was always putting bands together. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a time when the heavy metal and the hair bands, the, the big 80s hair bands and stuff on Sunset Strip were very popular. And I really wasn't uh, a, a metal guy, you know. I really wasn't um, that, you know. I, 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 I was more of a, I, I don't know, I, I, I loved rock and roll, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I was a little bit more of a songwriter, singer. I wanted to, you know, wanted to explore uh, a little bit more sophisticated stuff, I guess, and so there weren't as many venues. I mean, if you wanted to, if you wanted to put together a, a Guns N' Roses or or a Motley Crue or a Quiet Riot, you know, there were plenty of venues for you to find your way to play at. It was just really popular, and it was a little harder if you were uh, 
um, doing a Billy Joel thing or, you know, um, you know, some other band that, you know, that was, uh, I guess that's maybe why I gravitated toward a lot of the, uh, the bands from the UK at the time. Because uh, they they uh, they were popular too, but not so much in a gr- grassroots sense. Because there weren't as many here that started here. I mean, there weren't uh, bands like that as much. L.A. was just a rock and roll hair band mecca at the time. So networking was was always difficult. It still is for me. You know, um, that's part of the uh, you know part of the process. On, on you know, it's it's kind of who you know and. And who you can get, but the important thing is to keep keep playing and, and keep getting out there. You know, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I, I'm 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 doing my best on this one because oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think it's perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, because uh, th- that's what we wanted to know. Like, what were your experiences uh, on that scene? And I think uh, much has been said about this whole hair metal thing in LA at the time. And you were obviously from a different kind of. Uh, circle so um th- that's interesting C- can you tell us more about uh your time uh, uh in the 80s as a musician what sure. were you trying to do were there any uh c- special gigs that you did uh maybe clubs that you played sure well uh remember in the 80s i wanted to be a singer and that was my primary instrument and my main goal and so i was either in bands or putting bands together that featured me as the lead singer that's that's kind of you know i was writing the songs and and singing so i was pursuing things that i was able to perform in uh i was playing piano and playing guitar but those were more used for me to write songs and occasionally on stage i'd play a little bit but i was mostly on the microphone myself and um I uh I was in a show called Too Young for Prime Time Too Young for Prime Time Players which was a kids show. I I was about 15 or 16 and I uh the guy that was running this show was uh apparently in the music business and he was the road manager for Seals and Crofts and he had all these music connections and he was he put these little shows together every weekend at the Roxy for parents and their kids' birthday parties. And um, it's kind of strange being an adult venue, but on Sundays it was sort of like a romper room, you know? We had a, um, had a uh, sort of a, a, a variety show, if you will. You had dancers and singers, and the kids were all different ages. I was probably the oldest one. But I came in, and I, I even brought a band in at one point to, to back up the other uh, players and stuff. So it was kind of like a you know, like a Tonight Show kind of thing. And uh, we played every weekend for like three years. And it was amazing. For It was the best education I could have gotten because I was in front of, even though the audience was young, it didn't matter. They were live bodies and they were listening. And I had an audience on a big stage every weekend. And, you know, that's not the kind of experience you, you can get in a school, you know. It, it was really incredible. Yeah. And from that, that led me to doing um, a segment on the Merv Griffin show, which I don't know if you guys know what that was, but the Merv Griffin show was kind of like the Tonight Show in the in the 80s, and Merv Griffin was a very popular uh, talk show host, uh, real, you know, really uh, kind of a big wig in the business, and he had this show. Something like uh, something like Jimmy Kimmel. Yeah, just like that. I mean, that's where all those shows came from. They came from. <clears throat> Excuse me. It came from Johnny Carson's Tonight Show and Merv Griffin's show, and both those shows they kind of run concurrently, and uh, it, it was a very uh, well-known nationally broadcast show. And um, they did a segment on the show in which I was in, and they asked some of the kids, including myself, to come on and sing a song, on national TV, and that was my uh, that was a very you know, big move for me because I had up on that up up until that point at 15 or 16 years old, I had only been playing on little stages and the Roxy, of course. But um, yeah, that so that's what kind of led me. That's what kind of got me into the acting, and it was just sort of the way things were run, just kind of way things meandered. You know, I I didn't really have a plan or a, 
uh, away. And certainly at 16 years old, I was just taking everything that came, you know. Uh, but you were, you were just hungry for experience, right? Yeah, but mostly anywhere I could sing. That was my goal. Uh, what? You need me to sing? Okay, I, I'm there. You know, I, it was just I wanted to make sure that I was constantly singing and constantly playing and, and hopefully even playing my own songs. They wouldn't let me perform my own song on the Merck Griffin show. <laughs> I, had to, I had to choose from a list of pre-licensed material that they had. So it was kind of disappointing. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah. Right. So now we've got your very beginnings covered in your early years. Now I want to ask you um, about the other projects that you're involved in nowadays. So can you can you tell us a little bit about about those, that stuff? Well, obviously, you know, with the lockdown situation right now in our country, certainly in California, there are no gigs. I mean, you know, I'm not I'm not able to do anything that I normally do right now. And it's it's very frustrating and, and hard. And, um, you know, it's just the way it is. And um, so Survivor, normally I'd be on tour right now. We uh, we had the whole year ready to go. In fact, my bags were packed when I got the call that, uh, you know, you're not coming. <laughs> and uh, they're oh, from man. Chicago. Yeah, it was disappointing. They're from Chicago, so you know we usually meet up in Chicago. We do a rehearsal for a week or two, and then we go out, and uh, everything was canceled. Now, I have other projects that I work with when I'm not on the road with, with, uh, with Survivor, and uh, one of my favorite bands is the uh, KTEL All-Stars. And I don't know how popular KTEL was in the 70s in Serbia or the, 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 the old Yugoslavia or Czechoslovakia. Czechoslov Slovakia, what, what, what was Serbia? Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia. So you, you okay. were right the first time. Yugoslavia. Okay, uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, anyway, the point is, is that uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, oh, KTEL. So KTEL was a um, kind of a, like a record company that used to take these compil compi uh, compilation records of all the big hits at the time, and they'd come out with these, you know, KTEL hits. And they were very iconic in the 70s. And they played, you know, they had different different genres of compilation records that they that they had put out. And this band that I'm in, the KTEL All-Stars, we, re we reproduced these songs from the 70s. Uh, very, very detailed. And it's an incredible band, a lot of fun. I tour with them a lot. I mean, we go all over the country. And, uh, you know... So it's funny because, you know, when Survivor's not working, I, I, I'm working with them. And since nobody's working, I'm not working. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of kind of not, not so good right now. Uh, yeah, very tough period for all of us uh, in one yeah. way or another. But I think hopefully this will be over soon. Uh